is Darius Aria for Ancient Rome Live. Today, we're going to talk about the gladiator, the gladiator in Rome specifically. And this is part of our ongoing webinar series on Sundays. And everything that we do ends up on our YouTube channel, but there's even more information per lecture with bibliography, with more of a write-up on the Ancient Rome Live org platform. So do check it out because we're really enhancing it this summer and putting a lot of content as well, new videos every week. You can support us. Uh, go right to ancientromelive.org slash donate. Share it with your organizations, your colleagues. And if you're interested in setting up any kind of special relationship with your uh, organization, we're happy to have a conversation. So today again, Gladiator. And what's behind me is the famous Borghese uh, mosaic. I thought we'd just jump forward here in time to about the middle of the fourth century AD. This is something found in about 1834, and it's on the Via Casalina, a property that's uh, excavated. And of course, you find something magnificent like this, chopped up into pieces and transferred to, uh, to the Galleria Borghese. And it was originally about uh, 28 meters in length. And what we see here are a bunch of gladiators in different kinds of breasts, and we also see their names. So immediately, we don't need just the movie Gladiator to know that gladiators became famous and become superstars. Here are some superstars from the middle of the fourth century AD. And we can see some names that stick out. So we have Atelomonius, Cupido, and Cupido is dead, because uh, you have that theta right there, and the, that uh, circle with a, a line through it, and the guy killing him, the letter phones, and then we have, uh, let's see over here, I'm blocking Arius down below, and then off on the side there, Melia, which might be Meliagor, um, to, that's gonna be an abbreviation. So here are some people, slaves, trained to be killers who are so important enough that they are recorded in a rich person's private estate. And that says already a lot about who the gladiator was. Uh, where, how did he become one? Uh, how did he train? Uh, you know, what was the life of a gladiator? That's what we're talking about today. Um, and we'll get into it in, in many different ways. For example, these guys are professional trained fighters. That's the whole point of being a gladiator person trained to use a gladius a sword. We know they're, for the most part, people that have been enslaved. So that is people that are conquered in war and then they're sold off and acquired by someone, eventually trained to fight for entertainment. They're also people that are condemned criminals. So you've lost your right of being a citizen. And now you are, without that status, you are property and you're sold off and you are, in this case here, forced to go into a school to learn how to fight, to then ultimately perform for someone's entertainment. Is the two main ways. How long did they last? How long were you, and that's a big question. Uh, we look at some of these uh, excavated gladiator uh, grave sites. Uh, we got a lot of estimates, a lot of scholarship, a lot of ink has been spilled. And uh, it's a really great open-ended question. And it goes from uh, mortality rate in the arena one in 10 down to one in five. And no matter what though, they're not great odds. And considering the fact that you're fighting maybe 10 times in a year, you really are staring death in the face every time. That's what it really seems. And you have a lot of uh, scholars that have really addressed this issue and no one can really do it with, I think, any satisfactory um, conclusion because uh, just like so much in archeology, span we, we have small samples here and there. Uh, we don't have enough of a sense uh, really of getting realistic numbers. But it is definitely something much more in the face of danger than any sport I think that we have today. Uh, you can think of um, stunt drivers and you can think of race car drivers and you can think of 
you know, the, the cage fighting and the wrestling and the football players, you know, getting concussions and whatnot, but everything is going to pale in the face of people fighting with sharp swords uh, and other devices. Uh, so again, the majority of people don't have a choice. They've been forced into this line of work, as it were. Although we do know that on some occasions, freed people do go and fight. They do this largely to uh, gain a fortune or pay off their debt. Uh, because if you know, you imagine all the betting that surrounds this kind of activity in the amount of price they will fetch uh, on a high level, um, you know, a, a stage, something in Rome versus off in the provinces, then a pretty penny you could make, of course you had to live to survive, uh, to enjoy it. And then of course, we do have on occasion the citation of women also fighting as gladiators. So you can think of them appearing not, it's not they're not commonplace, but it's more of the novelty as would be an ambidextrous gladiator or a lefty and a left-handed gladiator. So there are different ways in which, as we move forward in here, we'll see that there's this interest in maintaining the interest and showing you something that you hadn't seen before. Okay, so we talked about people were uh, slaves, enslaved people, people whose uh, village, whose province, whose kingdom or whatnot lost to the Romans. And then a portion of the population was sold off, sold off to slavery. And some of those people, right, condemned to the mines, condemned to the fields, could also be forced to uh, learn the ways of the gladiator and train. So there were gladiator schools, and we'll get to that as well. Okay, let's just back up a little bit. What did they eat? How did these guys, look at these guys, these big buff men, right, looking very, dangerous. So we have some ancient sources. We have Pliny the Elder talking about bean and barley mash. Where's that big steak diet, you might be asking, right? Where's all that meat? But it seems that uh, with recent uh, research and looking at the sources and so forth, a lot of these guys, um, and actually uh, the physician Galen, a very famous physician, like the most famous physician from antiquity, uh, starts off as a doctor, a physician for gladiators in uh, Pergamon. He talks about he's not so he's not in love with this kind of diet because it makes them uh, kind of flabby. So you think about the flabbiness or that layer of fat that could come with that kind of diet would be that protective fatty layer protecting the vital organs. That's kind of a standard thing when we're talking about gladiators about what they ate and how they train and so forth. Not necessarily always uh, what you see in the movies. And the second thing that came out recently, more recently, is the issue that they had a kind of, um, what's it called, ancient Gatorade, which is charred plants rich in calcium, great for strengthening your bones. And we have that kind of <coughs> evidence, again, in Pliny the Elder saying, um, if you want to uh, be healthy, uh, try this uh, drink uh, with a lot of plant ash. It's great for you. And you can see how gladiators as well are replenished after fighting. So it's kind of like this pick me up kind of thing, but essentially it's giving you components in your uh, diet, your regime that help uh, promote calcium uh, growth. So it'd be like drinking a glass of milk or something. So that's something to consider uh, when we're thinking about these. Uh, these gladiators, what they're eating, not just how they're training. Let's pop in here for see some questions. Would the estate owner have owned those gladiators? That's a great question. Yes, that's within their own possibility. Why do gladiators not continue the profession after the end of state sponsorship? And we'll get to that. Uh, but definitely it is ultimately something in the Christian era. It takes a while for this to happen. But by the uh, beginning of the 5th century, that's when you really have a real pushback about why should we have slaves fighting? So slavery is allowed for a very long time, you know, beyond Christianity being legalized under Constantine. But eventually, it's this push from the Christian uh, component society, uh, the clerics, saying, 
hey, I don't think this is good to do to our fellow man. And that really leads to the end of having men fighting against men to the death. And the final step in the sixth century is finally to eliminate the other great spectacle in the amphitheaters, which is man fighting against wild animal. So obviously no one was there in the fifth and sixth centuries for a long time saying, oh, the poor animals. Uh, first it was man against man, no good. We'll still kill the animals and then finally, no, we're not gonna do that either. Was it always to the death? Did they gain the freedom? Absolutely, it was not always to the death and they could, yes, indeed gain their freedom. Just as we talked about the enslaved peoples of the Roman Empire uh, just the other week, uh, again, they too, with the peculium there, stipend, uh, they could also buy their freedom. Bettany Hughes, recent program, top 10, uh, Pompeii talked about the bean stew diet, yep, and how fat protected muscles and showed modern equipment being made. Absolutely. Uh, tasty. Um, I'm, not, I'm not super thrilled at, uh, at, uh, at living off of something like that, but, um, you know, it's uh, the Romans, think about when we're talking about experimenting, thinking about when they're implementing something, like the creation of the Pantheon. And we look at it today and say, wow, they're really, really exaggerated, over the top. Those walls are so thick, they didn't need to be that thick to support the weight of the dome. But it's that exaggeration that led to the success of a structure that's 1900 years old. So too, we can look at something like the diet Think about how they're looking at what the gladiator, this investment over hundreds and hundreds of years. This is better, this is not better. We gave them this, this doesn't work. So just again, I think when we look at these things and people are writing about in ancient times and we're doing discoveries and we're studying the bones of the deceased and so on, there's really a lot of experimentation and evolution of a practice uh, in uh, the ancient Roman world, and we kind of see those results. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna zip through a number of things here. We talked about who the gladiators were, some examples we can talk about. The main, the key ones were the man wearing a fish uh, on his helmet, a fish helmet, that's the Mermillon, and we have the Semnite, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about them, but essentially it's a fighting style. They're heavily armed and have a long shield. You can see a big long shield up above my head. Uh, and the Thracian has a round shield and a curved sword. And then the Retiarius is lightly armed and has a trident. And you can actually see the trident right behind me as well. Uh, it looks like what will be the deceased right there, Retiarius. So we have four main kinds. And of course, you've got the guys on the horseback and the guys in the chariot, the Esedati, and they'll fight with different kinds of props and be forced to be in uh, scenarios of history and mythology and so forth that add to a lot of the pageantry, but essentially it's really about a man fighting against another man. Uh, don't think of it as football teams at all. Think about it as one, predominantly one on one. Okay, where's the idea coming from? Seems that it comes from the Etruscans. We have artwork in the sixth century that show people fighting or being put to death and the occasion of the death of someone. So funerary games. And um, Nicholas of Damascus in the first century tells us that it's an Etruscan concept. We have uh, Etruscan art. Uh, we have great videos on the Etruscan Museum that you can look at on Ancient Rome Live, so check those out. And uh, seems to verify that, that there's a, a, a Etruscan concept involved around the funerals of people. And then we were told by Livy that a lot of the games, some of the earlier games are uh, surrounding the victory against the Samnites, the Samnite War. The Samnites were a brutal opponent of the Romans to conquer uh, much of the peninsula of Italy, and ultimately you round a lot of them up and put them to fight as entertainment for you. And when we jump into Rome and we jump into what's really happening in the city, you go to 264 BC for the first games that are recorded in the Forum Boarium, and they are funerary games of Brutus Pera. And then we jump to 216. Uh, and that's only three pairs of gladiators fighting. In 216 BC, it's the funeral of Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. 22 uh, pairs will fight. And then in 200 BC, Marcus Valerius Lavinius. 25 pairs will fight. In 200 BC, a progression here. 
200 BC, a funeral of Publius Licinius, 60 pairs will fight. Titus Flaminius, on his dad's funeral, has 74 gladiators fighting over three days. It just gets starts to crescendo. And then we get a big part of more, and these are those are all what? Those are private individuals, and they've got these obligations or duties, duties to be met, the munera. And uh, they're going to conduct them largely during uh, the funeral of somebody. But over time, by 105 BC, it's picking up and surrounding ludi, state games, festivals honoring the gods. So it's becoming something a little more official. But for the most part, it's private individuals, not officials. And the real tie is going to be with someone dead. The new add-on can be the occasional victory or triumph. But what happens is, this is the interesting thing, this is kind of like the kicker, is that when you start to honor somebody, when you're getting into the end of the Republic, you can honor them, but it doesn't have to be exactly at the time of the funeral. It can be put off and it becomes implemented when it's convenient for you, when you are running for political office, when you're trying to get elected, when you're trying to get people to follow your lead. And a famous case of all, most famous case is Julius Caesar. So he's vowing these uh, uh, games in 65, but he can't ultimately, and he, we don't know what kind of game exactly he was intended for his aunt, but he does ultimately have 320 pairs fighting in 45 BC to honor his daughter who had died eight years before. So again, that just really nails the, uh, you know, the lid on the coffin here that there really was a lot of leeway in which you could implement those moon or these obligations. I mean, my God, the poor soul of Julia waiting to be honored, as it were, eight years later. But let's remember, let's remember, uh, there are a lot of slave revolts between 170, the most famous, of course, Spartacus and Capua, and breaking out of a, a, of a slave school for gladiators called Ludus. And let's face it, that at the end of the Republic, we're really getting into about 120 and thereafter, so serious are these gladiator schools that they are becoming the blueprint from which the, uh, the military, the state, the soldier is now being trained. It's not the other way around. It's not that the military school for training the Roman citizens in the army is so amazing, it's adopted by the gladiator schools. Actually, it's the entrepreneurs, as it were. It's the guys that are trying to really, in a cutthroat competition of having the best trained gladiators for these performances, they up the, the game, as it were, and the military says, hmm, that's actually very good. And we know what they're doing. They're, they're practicing with, with weighted wooden swords. They have that kind of dummy. Uh, they have obstacle courses. They're doing calisthenics and so forth. This kind of boot camp is then going to be adopted. No one ever forgets the danger of the gladiators, the danger exhibited by Spartacus. We can move forward in time and we can think about Augustus and he is passing some limitations. So he says the praetors can only hold two games a year with maximum 120 participants at a time. It's further restricted by Tiberius. And when we get down to Domitian, Domitian who is the younger son of Vespasian who built the Colosseum, He's saying the only people that can have gladiator games in Rome, only the emperor. So it's really getting restricted. And outside of the provinces, if you want to hold gladiatorial games, you need official approval. So this is something that is it's the ultimate. It's the ultimate of display. And so you're going to regulate and you're going to monitor because whoever's going to fund this stuff, and it ain't cheap, they want to be recognized. They want to be as somebody in society. So they're always a potential danger, let's say, within the given social order. And when do they have these games? The big annual games really focus on December, end of year. And it's looking at the kind of you know, end of year, beginning of a new one. And it's also about uh, funerary games and remembering the dead. And of course, you have the Saturnalia that's also taking place. 
And it really is a great, you know, turning of the page. So that's kind of clean out house and start anew. Of course, there can also be the funerary occasions. There can be the state triumph, but it really isn't something ever like a football uh, schedule. And it's something that really depends upon victories and anniversaries of the emperors, you know, when they want to hold games. And of course, December is the big one of the year. So the inauguration of the Colosseum was huge under Titus with 9,000 animals killed and 10,000 gladiators fighting. But the most of all, the ma most massive uh, gladiator spectacles ever were under Trajan for his Dacian triumph in 107, 10,000 gladiators and 11,000 animals were killed. So we spent some, you know, quite a bit of time talking about man against man, but of course man against animal is a whole other conversation, the bestiarii. And it's a big deal, very exciting. And when we think of the four gladiator schools surrounding the Colosseum, we have uh, the Ludus Magnus, the Dacian school, the Gallic school, and the Matutinus Ludus. So that is the morning show. So you have uh, the bestiati, finding the wild animals in the morning. Noontime is execution of criminals, and the gladiators, the main event after lunch. So you have the trainers, the lanista, you have the gladiator schools, you have uh, such, such a popular uh, event that people go to the Ludus Magnus. It's large enough to hold several thousand people to watch kind of spring training and to see these superstars practice. And then you go right across the street or through the tunnel uh, into the Colosseum to watch it all. Now, before any match, there's a pompa, which is a big kind of... Uh, uh, parade through the city. So it's kind of like a ticker tape parade for these guys that are facing death. And of course, when they go in the arena, there is going to be a, um, there's going to be always a referee, the sumerudis, and they've got long sticks to kind of direct and break up the fighting and so forth. So how long does about last? Maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. They don't last very long because they're wearing a lot of heavy armor and they're enjoying themselves a lot. And then what happens when the event is over? So you've either outright killed somebody, or you can acknowledge that you've lost by raising a finger. And then the editor, the person who's funding the games, the private individual decides whether or not they're put to death. Of course, the crowd is in it as well. And there's the issue of, is there gonna be an opportunity of missio? Is there gonna be an opportunity to spare the life of the gladiator or not? And as we move forward to the imperial period of time, there's more of this advertisement for, hey, there's not going to be any missio, sine missio, without missio. So you're really, when the guy loses, he's got to die. So you're upping the ante over and over and over again. And of course, when the editor says, yes, this guy is going to die, it's the famous Polnice Verso, the turned thumb. And of course, in the movies, we all see this, but it doesn't seem to be the case in, uh, in Latin. And in ancient times, well, that's how the moves are given it to us, but they definitely turn the thumb in some way it's turned. So we have some conjecture about that, maybe even like this, right? The jubilatio. Uh, so we're not exactly sure. Uh, and of course, there's entertainment to the max. Music is playing a lot. So we even have some great mosaics that show there's music accompanying it, kind of crescendoing as the battle moves forward and so forth. So there's a lot of really interesting a lot of interesting details that we get from mosaics, from the ancient uh, sources themselves, uh, from funerary reliefs of gladiators, and so forth. Now, again, uh, there are famous emperors that participate in these games, Caligula, Titus, maybe even Hadrian, Lucius Verus, Caracalla, and of course, our buddy uh, Commodus is going to be like a gladiator in the Colosseum itself killing bears, decapitating ostriches, and stuff like that. Not killed by Russell Crowe and Gladiator, but he is strangled by one of his Gladiator friends in the baths in his uh, villa, either on the Via Appia, the Villa de Quintili, or on the Palatine Hill. And uh, essentially, it is a bad way to go. So you probably don't want to be frequenting and hanging out with your buddy Gladiators because they can be very deadly. Uh, but that's what Commodus apparently did. And when does it all end? Again, we said in 423, that's pretty much the end of the Gladiator Games, the end of the Pagan Munera in uh, Rome. Thank you very much, Theodosius. And 
It really is uh, an, an honorius. It is a push. It is a struggle. But ultimately, the games are finished and the gladiator is no more. Was the average gladiator a better trained fighter than a legionary? That is an absolutely great question, but let's definitely say that ultimately their, their fighting preparation and training was going to be very similar. Of course, we're talking about the big bulking up of the gladiator versus I could think about the marching and the running and the horseback riding that the uh, uh, legionary does. I'd probably want to think that the legionary guy is in better shape. Uh, electrolyte drink was diluted vinegar. Was that reserved for soldiers and aspirin for gladiators or the interchange or even mixed? Yeah, I've heard of both as well. Exactly. Uh, the gladiator mosaic collection in the middle of the is great. Why are there so many in that one site? What's the history of the collection? Pretty much they're all found at one time in 1834 from that one property in the Casalina and, and, and sliced up and brought into Galleria Borghese. Uh, remember, in, in the 19th century then, talking 1834, uh, so much had been robbed out uh, by uh, Napoleon. Uh, so this is like a late addition to kind of replenish the Galleria Borghese and eventually a lot of the works of art we know come back. Um, yeah, they, they've got their underwear, they've got their, you can see, uh, you know, our, what we're really focusing on right now in these mosaics is a lot of uh, armor, or shoulder armor, and, uh, and shin greaves and stuff like that. But a lot of the body is exposed, so there will be blood. Um, yeah, so yeah, this whole Yugolatio thing is one other idea with that, yeah, so no thumb up, thumb down per se, we don't think. It's, we know it's turned but we do not think, right, it's like in the movies. That's just something that's made up. But, you know, hey, that's Hollywood. And, of course, from these great movies, Spartacus, Gladiator, and so forth, we can be entertained and we can be uh, engaged. And, you know, they're thinking of making a Hollywood movie of talking to your contemporary audience as well to make it resonate. And that cuts both ways uh, to be as accurate as possible and not. Uh, and that's the reality we get from movies. But a lot of them are great, even if they're not the most uh, accurate. So thank you guys very much for joining me. It's been great to, to have you here today in Rome. Do check out ancientromelive.org. We've got videos dropping every week. We're filling in Ancient Rome Live content as well on the website, and you'll see more of that in the coming months. And do take a look at uh, Darius Ari Diggs and my YouTube channel. Uh, today, uh, happy Father's Day again. I was inside the Pantheon for the uh, solstice, and it was a beautiful view. I hope you guys enjoy what we're offering you so many different views on rome i don't think honestly anyone else is anywhere near what we're doing for you with the webinars and with the, what we're showing on social media and then the videos the ancient rome live pro, uh, platform we do hope you can share this and we hope you continue to share your enthusiasm thanks a lot